We have with us today an incredible guest. I think it's one of the great honors of our origin show to have with us today Dr. David Menton. Dr. Menton, can I just tell you what a privilege it is to have you here? Oh, thank you, Don. It's my pleasure. For 34 years, you taught at uh, Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, in the mm -hmm. School of Medicine there. Well, at the medical school, I taught in the first year of the medical school. All medical students take the sort of basic science or preclinical year. And one of the very first courses that the student is introduced to is gross anatomy, which is the dissection of the human body. And I taught that for several years. Uh, but my primary responsibility was to teach uh, how the body looks through the light and electron microscope, sort of microscopic anatomy. We sometimes refer to that under the Greek name histology. Histology. Right. That means to look at the tissues of the body. Now, you're a very humble man, but you are one of the world's experts in, in that field. Isn't that true? You might say I sort of wrote the book on it to some degree and that uh, I uh, was the editor consultant for histology for Stedman's Medical Dictionary for five editions up until the last edition. And so when it came to what words meant in the field of histology, you wrote the book. Yeah, it was kind of a sobering experience. I could yeah. go in and decide. Uh, of course, I had to be as accurate as possible. <laughs> Today we're going to talk the about the scene. Eye is so complicated that uh, it defies our ability to uh, actually explain it. Uh, if I were to pick one person who is sort of one of the most visible authorities in the eye, I think I would pick Dr. Stuart Duke Elder, uh, who's an Englishman, okay. a physician, and has written a, a set of books, or edited a set of books, that are really an encyclopedia on the eye, beginning with its evolution, then its anatomy, its physiology, its pathology, its surgery, right on through. And in the first volume of that series called The Eye and Evolution, uh, Dr. Duke Elder said, it would seem, therefore, that despite the considerable amount of thought expended on the question of the emergence of the vertebrate eye with its inverted or upside-down retina of neural origin and its elaborate dioptric mechanism derived from the surface ectoderm, it is a problem is yet unsolved. Explain that to me. The vertebrae, what, what is it, what's he saying to us there? Well, he's saying what's that uh, we haven't been able to come up with a, an explanation uh, for the origin of the eye. Uh, for example, he goes on to say that, uh, uh, indeed, appearing as it does, the eye, fully formed in the most primitive species that exist today, and in the absence of any transitional forms in the fossil record that you might see. So in the most basic fo primitive forms, you still have these still fully have devel eye. developed eyeballs. All the different kinds of organisms, primitive, advanced, whatever, as we might call it, eyes are always complicated. And he goes on to say that he finds little likelihood of finding a satisfactory explanation to this solution. That's amazing. So he says, we really don't know anything about the eye, and he really doesn't think we're going to ever know anything about the eye. And the thing that's really intriguing is that this is an 847-page book done. <laughs> and I would think that if I were studying the origin of the eye and I'd come to the conclusion that we know nothing and that we never will know anything about it, <laughs> I could have gotten that point across in maybe six, 700 pages. You I wouldn't think, have needed you don't think actually, 847. That are, you wouldn't have needed the last 150 pages. <laughs> well, tell me, what do trilobites have to do with us learning about the human eye? Well, that's an interesting story. Let me run up here to the... Uh, Please do go. Go up to the screen there uh, and show us what you got. whatever this is, and uh, yeah. we'll talk about it a little bit. <laughs> These are trilobites. They, they look like roly-polies. If you've ever seen a roly-poly, you know that they uh, are kind of segmented creatures. They lived in the ocean. Presumably, according to evolution, it became extinct a long time ago. And the interesting thing is that they have many different types of eyes, at least five fundamentally different types of eyes, and some of the trilobites didn't have eyes at all. The thing that's intriguing is that there are two species of trilobites in which their sort of glass lens has been studied, they find out these lenses didn't need to focus. They were in focus from just a, a small fraction of an inch out to infinity without having to change the position of the lens. And uh, not only that, but this is amazing. The lens is a, is a compound lens in the sense that it's made up of more than one kind of glass that's been ground and put together, you might say, uh, cemented to make a doublet. And uh, this particular trilobite here has a lens that was discovered by Descartes uh, back in the uh, 1600s and was believed to be the most perfect lens that could be designed at the time. And this particular lens here, found in another trilobite, again a doublet put together, uh, is identical essentially to a lens designed by another great physicist by the name of Huygens at about the same time. So uh, here we have trilobites running around with highly corrected lenses 
<laughs> that uh, are a little hard to explain. Well, let's talk about the human eye. We've Good. talked about trilobites, and we'll go on to look at that. People usually don't understand that the eye is really part of the brain. Oh, you is look that at right? somebody's eye, you're actually checking the brain out a bit here. <laughs> and the eye comes from a, a, a pouch that comes out from the brain. There's a little ball, and it gets pushed in like a basketball here that got pushed in. And uh, that's all part of the brain. Uh, the lens of the eye and the cornea, the window in the front, actually buds off from the surface, basically skin. And uh, these uh, two structures, one will form the retina of the eye, and the other part will form the lens and the cornea. So two different origins there. This is a kind of a uh, picture of what one fourth of the eye would look like. And here is the lens the way it has developed in an adult, be the left eye looking up. And the lens is kind of suspended by little strings. They're sort of hollow tubes. And the lens is clear as glass, but it's flexible, like a rubber ball. Huh. And the tension of the filaments at the edge can either cause that lens to become flattened or to round up. Uh, there are cells that grow on the surface of the uh, lens. These cells move around to the edge. And when they get to the edge, they turn into the lens. And when they turn into the lens, they become elongated, like pulling an antenna out of a car. And it actually goes from up here all the way around to down here, each lens. Let's take a look at those uh, lenses. We'll magnify that edge of the lens. You're just taking that little edge and magnifying it up again. Right. In the light microscope, we're just going to look at that left edge there, right where you see the box. Okay. And uh, over here we can see it. Cells are like little box cars coming down to the edge, turning into the lens, at which time they become elongated. Huh. And uh, when they become elongated, they form what we call lens prisms. Let's look at those lens prisms in the scanning electron microscope. Sort of looks like a lumber yard. It really does. <laughs> Piles of stuff there. Individual cells, each of these board-like structures is a cell. Having a little trouble seeing that there, we can bring it up a little higher power. And notice that these boards are interlocked in perfect register by a little uh, uh, peg and socket. Yeah. Thousands and thousands per cell interlocking it. Uh, the cell is full of a protein called crystalline, which is very clear and uh, gives the lens its clear property. Uh, just think of this whole mechanism. These cells are dead, basically, in our lens. And uh, they're soft. But uh, I don't know about you, Don, but you get to be my age. <laughs> and the lens becomes harder. Yes. And as it becomes harder, we can't focus anymore. So if I take my glasses off, here's focus for me. Yeah. Further away, in closer, out of focus. I have to have special progressive lenses. Now my focus got just got slightly past the length of my arm. That's what mine <laughs> is, is right? now. Yeah. And I believe the Lord made us to have a lens that would focus uh, and be functional uh, for our whole lifetime, but since the fall into sin, uh, our lenses are just one of the things in our body it's affected by the fall. that can become defective with time. And it changes in color. It's kind of yellow. Uh, it can get opacities in there that we call cataract. Yes. Uh, it can become hard and not focus. But in the original conception, it clearly is a nice, rubbery, flexible lens right. that can change focus. It's just amazing that uh, we are put together in a way that has been described as fearfully and wonderfully made. And that is certainly the case here. You know, we've got to take a break. You stay with us, and in just a minute, Dr. Menton's going to come back, and he's going to really reinforce what we're learning about how the intricacy of the eye teaches us the marvel of our Creator. Creation versus evolution. You weigh the evidence. The human eye, a chemical speedster. For us to see, chemical and electrical reactions must take place in the proper sequence. The fastest photographic film requires the camera lens to remain open for one ten thousandth of a second. Biologists tell us that the eye's photochemistry is so fast that the first reaction takes place in one five billionth of a second. This is 500,000 times faster than our best film capabilities. Darwin himself admitted that the human eye seemed to defy his theory of evolution. 